Edgar Cayce, the Sleeping Prophet, a man who supposedly discovered the fate of Atlantis, helped many hundreds, if not thousands, with his abilities to heal through psychic readings, and made future predictions and more. In today's video, I will be covering the life of Edgar Cayce, from his early encounters to the legacy left behind in the Association of Research and Enlightenment. Edgar was born into a farming family on March 18, 1877, in a very small community in the hills of southeastern Kentucky. He was born to Mother Carrie Elizabeth and Father Leslie Burr Casey, being one child of six. Edgar would say, as a child, he would see the spirit of his grandfather early on becoming enthralled with the Bible. And as a child, Edgar built a small makeshift hut in the woods as a childhood hideout. And in May of 1889, at the age of 12, he, while in his hut, encountered a winged woman who told Edgar his prayers had been answered. She would then go on to ask Edgar what he desired most of all. Though Edgar had been frightened by the winged woman, he gave an answer. He wished to help people, especially children. And in school, Edgar would struggle with his schoolwork, not being able to focus on his lessons. And the night after this winged woman appeared, Edgar's teacher had made a complaint to his parents on his struggles. So Edgar's father placed Edgar at a table, quizzing him on his spelling. And as he expected, Edgar did poorly. His father, angered by this, knocked Edgar out of his chair onto the floor. After this, it seems the winged woman took pity on Edgar. She spoke to him, telling Edgar, if he slept with his head on the book, they could help him. So Edgar did this, going to the realm of dreams, and soon his father returned to find him asleep, awaking him. Upon awaking Edgar, he was to be tested again, but this time he was ready for what he had been told to do, worked remembering all of the book's contents. However, his father felt he had been somehow fooled by his son, so again he knocked Edgar to the ground. Edgar would claim he used the method to remember this book all throughout the rest of his life and schooling, and reportedly soon becoming a top student in his class, making his father proud. And one day, during a school ball game, Edgar somehow hit his tailbone. Reportedly, that while he was asleep, Edgar was able to diagnose and cure this injury. It is said his family prepared the cure according to his instructions. And for several years after this, Edgar's nights of sleep dreaming seemed to be absent from any guidance, at least to his current understanding of things, as he was only a child. And in December of 1893, the Casey family moved to Hopkinsville, Kentucky at 705 West 7th Street and Young, which is now a sheriff's office. Soon, his family could no longer afford to pay it for Edgar's education, ending in the ninth grade. Edgar would then seek out employment and soon began discovering his clairvoyancy. Four days before Edgar's 20th birthday, he became engaged to Gertrude Evans, and at this time, he would teach at a Sunday school and recruit missionaries and would read the Bible at least once a year. Edgar also had an interest in the Disciples of Christ, a form of Protestantism, Edgar would claim to be able to see one's aura, to communicate with angels or entities, and the deceased, but Edgar would question whether these abilities were spiritually derived. And by 1900, he and his father would form a partnership selling life insurance. However, by March of the same year, Edgar had caught laryngitis, leading to him losing his voice, forcing him to stay with his parents until he got better or they found something he could do. Luckily, Edgar soon became an apprentice at W.R. Bowles for photography. Later, in the fateful year of 1901, Hopkinsville had a visitor, Hart the Laugh Man, a traveling hypnotist. And while in town, Hart had heard about Edgar's predicament, offering Edgar an attempt at curing it. Edgar accepted the offer, and Hart's attempt would take place in the office of Manning Brown, a local throat specialist. Hart would put Edgar in a hypnotic state, during which his voice returned, but after coming to, his voice was gone again. Hart is said to have stated that the attempt failed due to Edgar being unwilling to enter the third stage of hypnosis and not taking the hypnotic suggestion. After this, Edgar is said to have had help with a local hypnotist to regain his voice, the hypnotist being Al Lane, and while under Lane's trance, Edgar would tell Lane to suggest 
to increase the blood flow to his throat, after which Edgar's throat became bright red and for 20 minutes declaring that the throat treatment was done himself. His voice would return after this, but with periods of silence, eventually, after a series of trances with Lane, in which Edgar, while entranced, would find and diagnose his ailment to then begin suggesting cures, and in the end, his voice would fully return. Lane believed Edgar to be a clairvoyant and suggested him to make his abilities available to the public. However, Edgar was reluctant, as he was unaware of what he'd be prescribing or if it was safe. He would agree, though, under two conditions. First, that it must be free. And second, if he ever caused harm to anyone, he would never do it again. Edgar and Lane began offering treatment to the local townspeople, and soon a newspaper report was made on Edgar. He began getting letters in the mail from the curious and those in need, and even entrepreneurs. Edgar is said to have treated every letter as if its writer was there with him. And all Edgar needed to do his readings was your full name and location, so he worked off very little info. Through these readings, he would often diagnose your physical or mental affliction, referring to these as an entity or entities, then prescribing one of his various cures. Though Edgar was giving many readings, he still wasn't very confident. His ability safety saying, one dead patient is all he needed to be a murderer and Gertrude would share his anxiety about this. And in May 1902, Edgar was working in a bookshop, living in a home with several other various professionals, two being doctors. Sadly, his voice would go again, and Lane would begin treating Edgar weekly again. It's said, though, that Edgar would keep this secret, and Edgar and Gertrude would marry on the 17th of June 1903, eventually having three children together. And by the next year, Edgar would invent the card game, Pit, being based on the grain and produce market trading. The game was a success, but Edgar did not reap any of the reward of it, as he had sent the idea to a game producer who copyrighted the game and gave Edgar no royalties. Lane would go on to expose what Edgar was doing to his boarding house he lived in, forcing him to stop his readings, after which he moved to Franklin to become qualified in osteopathy, being similar to a chiropractor. After the exposing of Edgar, he gained some publicity, being supported by several doctors who were mainly younger. And soon, Edgar and a relative of his opened a photo studio in the town of Bowling Green, and a community of doctors who were interested in the claims around Edgar would begin to investigate him. They reportedly were able to verify that Edgar's readings were accurate, saying that and then saying that the doctors offered Edgar quite a lucrative business deal that he would deny. The experiments would end after Edgar had a violent reaction while in a trance, Edgar saying he would only do readings now for those who truly needed it. And then the years of 1906 and 07 were difficult for Edgar, as the photo studio would burn down not once, but twice, leaving Edgar bankrupt. And his first son would be born in March of 1907, being Hugh Lynn, and Edgar would give readings to his family being successful, building his confidence. By 1909, Edgar was debt-free, and his father would introduce him on Christmas Eve to homeopath Wesley H. Ketchum, who wanted to go into business with him, who, as before, was denied. Edgar, at this time, made his living at H.P. Tesler photography firm, and on October 10th, Edgar was interviewed by the New York Times, in which he stated he was able to easily go into an intuitive sleep being different than just normal sleep, intuitive sleep coming through your subconscious. Wesley would offer Edgar a partnership for a second time, this time being successful, convincing Edgar to accept. And as his lasting agreement, he would only do it if it was free. So Edgar, Wesley, Albert No, and Edgar's father, Leslie, would form the Psychic Reading Cooperation. And around this time, it said Edgar would begin prophesizing, though unsure of what he was doing, and this also being the beginning of his daily readings. Edgar preferred his readings to have a scientific basis, but at this time the only doctors willing to cooperate with Edgar were in Hopkinsville, and his patients were located elsewhere. Edgar's cures would vary so much he required several different specialists, 
and on May 17, 1911, Edgar and Gertrude's second son Milton would die before even reaching the age of three months old. Edgar would help solve ca the case of George Dalton, a man who died to a construction accident, and Gertrude would catch tuberculosis, and her doctor would give up on treating her, so Edgar would take up the responsibility of treating her, eventually curing her, it said, and that in 1912, Edgar would discover Wesley had lied about his gambling through his readings. And when he confronted Wesley, Wesley would say that the money he gambled had nothing to do with their business. And soon, Edgar would leave to Selma, Alabama. He would live off the donations to practice his craft and doing photography, opening a studio in 1913. And while in the studio, Hugh Lynn would severely burn his eyes from the flash powder, reportedly having healed through Edgar's readings. And the next few four years would have no major events other than the birth of Edgar Evans on February 9, 1918. However, in the following years, Edgar, to raise money for a hospital, would form a partnership with others to find oil in Texas, spending four years there, unsuccessful. And upon returning to Selma in 1923, he would hire 18-year-old Gladdy Davis to be his secretary, basically becoming family. Hey, we're talking again with Gladys Davis Turner, who from 1923 through 1945 was Edgar Casey's secretary. She stenographically recorded the vast majority of the psychic information which poured through Edgar Casey in his unconscious states. October 10th, 1922, Edgar would give an interview to the Birmingham Post-Herald, saying he had given, to that date, 8,056 readings. And Edgar would be approached by many businessmen and gamblers to give readings on the market and things like what to bet on and stocks, even others for the location of treasure. And one day, an artist and follower of metaphysics from Ohio, Arthur Lemurs, persuaded Edgar to focus his readings on the astrological, philosophical, and metaphysical. While under a trance, Arthur stated that Edgar would speak on his past lives and reincarnation. Edgar did not fully believe Arthur, as what Edgar reportedly said did not fit with Christian doctrine. Arthur claimed that Edgar had confirmed astrology, and with the following conversation being had, Edgar, I said all that? I couldn't have said all that in one reading. Arthur, no, but you confirmed it, you see. I have been studying metaphysics for years, and I was able, by a few questions, by the facts you gave, to check what is right and what is wrong with a whole lot of the stuff I've been reading. The important thing is, is that the basic system which runs through all the religions is backed up by you. Edgar was still unconvinced with Arthur. Arthur desperately wished Edgar to believe the same as him. As he thought, the reading had opened a door, and Arthur would convince Edgar to move to Dayton, Ohio, to pursue the understanding of metaphysics with Arthur, though both Edgar and Gertrude were skeptical of this, and during this time, Edgar would try to make sense of metaphysics within Christianity. Arthur believed that chapter 5 of Matthew was the Christian constitution, with the Sermon on the Mount being the Declaration of Independence. It is said that while entranced, Edgar understood metaphysics just as well as he did health. Arthur wished to form an organization to support Edgar, after which he would tell his family to come to Dayton, and upon reaching Dayton, he would fall financial problems. Edgar's readings would use electrotherapy, ultraviolet light, diet, massage, as well as astrology and dream work to enter his trances, being focusing on the environment and physical stimulation rather than mental. He would become noticed by the American Medical Association, making Edgar decide to become legitimate, and in 1925, Edgar claimed the voice told him to move to Virginia Beach. And by this time, he was a professional psychic with employees and with his readings becoming more esoteric. Edgar is said to have been able to see a person's aura and be able to astral project. Edgar was still not a rich man, being supported by generous donors. Gertrude would assist him in his readings, 
and Morton Blumenthal, a New York Stock Exchange worker, became interested in Edgar, offering to finance him, even giving him a Virginia Beach home. They would go on to form the Association of National Investigations in 1928 and would construct a hospital to scientifically study the readings, this being a dream of Edgar's. And to avoid any legal problems, to get a reading, he would have to join their association and agree, and agree to take part in their psychic experiments. Reportedly, the head of psychology department at the University of Washington and Lee was convinced by the readings and joined the uh, association, being Mosley Brown. The readings. The hospital held an opening ceremony on October 11th, 1928, and the hospital had a lecture hall, library, a vault for records, and offices. But it also had some luxuries, such as a living room, a 12-car garage, a tennis court, and a very large yard. Many would want Edgar to make a collection of his remedies for the medical community. And one day, Edgar would meet chemist Shankar Bais, who claimed to use clairvoyant knowledge to produce his medicine, collabor collaborating together to make atomidine, a version of iodine that is meant to be superior to the normal iodine, though there is no scientific evidence of this. And in 1928, the FDA would invalidate many of Edgar's remedies. The basis of many of these remedies being the assimilation of needed properties through the digestive system from food taken into the body, all being given to establish the proper equilibrium of the assimilation system. There were at least 35 remedies for digestion problems, and soon Blumenthal and Brown would wish to expand to create a university, being scheduled to open September 22, 1930. But six days before the opening, Blumenthal would hold a meeting, after which Blumenthal would take over the hospital, cutting its funding, and the university would be named Atlantic University. Blumenthal would abandon the university just after the first semester, and the following year of 1931, the ANI would disband in February, along with the hospital. However, on July 7th, the Association for Research and Enlightenment would form, with the university closing by the end of the year. Edgar, after the closing, would take all the recorded readings to his home, and he would begin focusing on a spiritual teaching, and his family, along with some friends, would ask how they themselves could become psychic. They would go on to form a small study group together, later writing two books called The Search for God, 1 and 2. Edgar, while under trance, would tell the group, bring the light to the waiting world. Edgar's readings now focused on dreams, synchronicity, intuition, astrology, the past life, the esoteric, and the Akashic records. The Akashic records came from theosophy and anthroposophy, being a collection of universal records containing all thoughts, events, words, emotion, and intent. Being encoded in the non-physical mental plane, the word Akasha, being Sanskrit, meaning the word aether, sky, or atmosphere, Blavatsky would say they are indestructible tablets of astral light. Akashic came from AP Senate, though, Blavatsky not using this term. The importance of these are disputed, though, and C.W. Leadbeater identified them as something a clairvoyant could read, claiming it contained the secrets of Atlantis and other civilizations, as well as the future all the way up to the 28th century. Alice Bailey saying they were a photographic collection of desires and experience, and that only a trained occultist could tell between the actual and astral being made by imagination and desire. And finally, Rudolf Steiner, who claimed to use them as a concept for his journal, Lucifer Gnosis, from 1904 to 08, writing on Atlantis, Lemuria, and more, also using the term in his lectures on the fifth gospel. Hugh Lynn, his son, would suggest Edgar to create a library dedicated to the various subjects they spoke on and to sponsor study groups. And at this time, Edgar was giving two readings a day. Hugh would start a monthly bulletin for the association consisting of interesting cases, book reviews, health hints, and psychic news. And the group's first congress was held in June 1932, having many guest speakers and Edgar giving public readings. 
the association would keep meticulous records, having a book called 100 Cases of Clairvoyance that would lead to some criticism, which I'll touch on later. The association's members would come from various Western as well as Eastern beliefs, and the philosophy of the A.R.E. was that truth came from a single source, and everything comes from that single source. Not opposing any religion and that their work was ancient and universal, Edgar felt for those for, who were fighting in World War II and their families, as both of his sons participated in the war, and his biography, There is a River, by Thomas Segru, released in March of 1943. And before speaking on his final years, I'll touch on some interesting topics Edgar would speak on while in a trance, usually while lying on a couch. First, one of his more popular topics, Atlantis. Well, you know, the story of Atlantis originated with Plato a few hundred years ago, a few hundred years B.C., excuse me. He heard it from Solon, who heard it from an Egyptian priest at Sais, and according to them, there was a continent-sized island in the Atlantic Ocean with a high civilization that was destroyed by volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and floods about 9,000 years previously. Well, that 9,000 years previously has worried people ever since. Edgar would say it stretched all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to Gibraltar in Spain, being destroyed in 10,000 B.C., though it had two earlier tragedies, first in 50,000 B.C. and 28,000 B.C., and was powered by a giant crystal that harnessed the power of the sun. The A.R.E. even has made expeditions to find these ruins, especially in the island of Bimini, near the coast of Cuba, saying Bimini was the mountaintops of Atlantis, once connecting to the neighboring island Andros, this large land mass being called Poseidia, sinking in 10,000 BC, being covered by what Edgar would call the slime of ages, and that it had a hall of records, along with two others, identical ones, one being under the Sphinx and the other in Pedras Negras, both areas being influenced by the Atlanteans. Edgar had also given 1,200 readings related to the topic of Egypt, claiming in a past life he was a priest Tarata who wanted to unify spiritual teachings. He also believed that Jesus was taught by Judith and had had two brothers and a sister, James, Jude, and Ruth, and that Jesus traveled from Egypt to India learning from the masters, believing that he was the greatest psychic of all time similar to Blavatsky's belief of him being an initiate into the mysteries. Edgar would also assign the mystic to the spirit, the psychic to the soul, and the occult to the mind, and all of his life readings would start with a look at one's astrological charts, revealing one's incarnations, and if they were on Earth, third dimension, or off-planet, being the non-third dimensional, predicting one's present or future, stating, though, that we influence the stars more than they influence us using our free will, and that our dreams could be used as a tool to give us insight, stating that what happens in life that's of importance was once a dream. Some examples of dream symbolism could be a lion for power and vanity, birds for love and spirit, water for emotion, and a grandparent for internal wisdom or your higher self. Edgar mentioned reincarnation and would state that we do not lose our past life's talents, though we may not realize them, with karma being our soul memory. He believed our next life did not immediately happen after our passing, that our soul is given time to take in what it has learned, then decide what it shall learn in the next life, and if it is to return to earth, it is likely that your soul would choose to be among those familiar to it, being called a soul group. Our soul selects everything, from our gender, family, and location. And all souls were made in the beginning, all from one spirit, with our deepest connections being spiritual. Edgar would say, the soul's development should take precedence over all things. And this takes time, with one acting through love, kindness, gentleness, and patience with our tools for atonement being prayer, talking to God, meditation, 
listening to God. And a lot of the controversy around Edgar lies in his belief in Atlantis, aliens, soul entities that had co-mingled with animals making giants, and polygenism, the belief that the races are all of different origin. Many also, on his prediction of the second coming of Christ in 1998, some saying he was a hoax and faking it all. Martin Gardner believed his trances came from a mix of ideas from Jung, Ospensky, and Blavatsky, saying he took little bits of info gleaned from here and there occult literature, spiced with occasional novelties from Casey's unconscious. Now back to Edgar, Edgar's final years. Edgar, in 1943, began getting so much mail, the post office could no longer deliver it, so Gertrude would have to go pick it up at the post office. Edgar would now start giving four to six readings a day, and the Coronet magazine would publish an article on Edgar, calling him the Miracle Man of Virginia Beach, giving him much more publicity. And as stated before, Edgar felt for those, impacted by the war, feeling he needed to help as many soldiers and their families as possible that came to him, especially the cases of the missing in action. He would go up to eight readings a day due to the overwhelming amount of requests, leaving Edgar mentally and physically drained. And in August of 1944, Edgar would collapse while giving readings from strain. He would then conduct a reading on himself being told to risk or risk dying, making him decide to move to the mountains of Virginia, where he had a stroke in September and passing on January 3rd, 1945 at the age of 67 years old, in the end giving 14,036 readings. And Gertrude would pass April 1st of the same year, being 65 years old. They would be buried in Riverside Cemetery, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. And some of the more notable supporters of Edgar were Wesley Ketchum, of course, who would go on to write the discovery of Edgar Casey, And he would also have clients such as Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Edison, Irving Berlin, and George Gershwin. And this has been the life of Edgar Casey. Thank you for watching today's video, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what topic you would like me to do next, and it may be my next video.